SAT College Board Exam Number Two, Section Three, Question One. If 5x plus 6 equals 10, what's the value of 10x plus 3? Well, to solve this equation, first I noticed that 5x is becoming 10x in the new expression. So subtracting 6 first, I get 5x equals 4, which I then double on both sides. So 10x equals 8, and then adding 3, the new expression 10x plus 3 equals 11. The correct answer was C. Question two, which of the following ordered pairs x, y satisfies the system of equations above? The system of equations has uh, two equations, x plus y equals 10 and three x minus two y equals 10. Doubling the first equation, which was x plus y equals zero, and then we'll have two x plus two y equals zero. Keeping the second equation the same, I rewrite 3x minus 2y equals 10. Now this system can be added together using the SAT shortcut. When you add the equations together now that they're scaled in this way, the y variables will cancel. 2x plus 3x is 5x. 2y plus negative 2y is 0. And 0 plus 10 is 10. Dividing by 5. On both sides, x equals 2. And b must be the correct answer because it's the only choice where the coordinate pair x, y has an x value of 2. The correct answer was b, 2 comma negative 2. Question 3. A landscaping company estimates the price of a job in dollars using the expression 60 plus 12 n h, where n is the number of landscapers who will be working and h the total number of hours the job will take using n landscapers. Which of the following is the best interpretation of the number 12 in the expression? Well, here at question three, we have a fixed cost, say $60 for the company to um, haul all of their equipment to the site. And then 12 and H, which is a varying cost. We're given that N is the number of workers and H the number of hours the job will take. So multiplying workers by hours is N H are the worker hours that will be on the job site. 12 will be the pay per hour for each landscape worker. So the correct answer is A. The company charges $12 per hour for each landscaper. Question four. 9a to the fourth plus 12a squared b squared plus 4b to the fourth. Which of the following is equivalent to the expression shown above? Well, several students asked me how to um, solve this equation. And um, if it's getting difficult to you, remember for you, remember that with algebraic expressions, you could plug in a value for a and b, such as a equals one and b equals two, and then figure out the value of the expression, and then use those same values, a equals one and b equals two, into the plugins above, uh, below for a, b, c, and d, and you'll see that a is the correct answer. Here I've shown the factor pattern that you should know for the SAT. Um, which we can verify using FOIL. So the factor pattern here for number four is a plus b squared is the same, is equivalent to a squared plus two ab's plus b squared. What makes this problem a little more advanced is that we have fourth degree squares on the first and last terms. So since we have nine a to the fourth, well, that's supposed to be a perfect square. And the last term, 4b to the fourth, is also a perfect square, which means that a must have been scaled to 3a squared, and b, the b term, was 2b squared, meaning that if we take 3a squared plus 2b squared, 2b squared, and then square that, meaning multiply it by itself, then we'll have, using FOIL, 9a squared plus 6a squared b squared plus 6a squared b squared plus 4b to the fourth, which will be, excuse me, 9a to the fourth 
plus 12 of those a squared b squareds plus four more b to the fourths. And that is the correct scaling for um, this factor pattern. The correct answer is a, 3a squared plus 2b squared, which is then squared, is equivalent to the equation above. Question five. The square root of 2k squared plus 17 minus x equals zero. If k is greater than zero and x equals seven in the equation above, what is the value of k? Well, isolating the radical first, we'll add x to both sides, and then we have the square root of 2k squared plus 17 equals x. Then plugging in seven for x, we'll then square both sides and we get what's underneath, 2k squared plus 17 equals 49. Subtract 17 from both sides, then divide both sides by two, and we have k squared equals 16. Take the square root and k equals four. The correct answer was C. For question five. Question six. In the xy plane above, line L is parallel to line K. What is the value of P? Well, we know that if they're parallel, parallel lines have the same slope ratio. So the slope of line L equals the slope of line K. The change in y over the change in x equals two minus zero over zero minus minus five, which is a slope ratio of two fifths. That must be all the same also for the green line K in the picture. So y equals two fifths x plus b. Well, we have the point for the y-intercept b at zero negative four. So b is negative four. That gives us the equation y equals two fifths x minus four. We're gonna plug in the point with the y value zero there in the green bubble. And so zero equals two fifths x minus four. Add four to both sides. Multiply both sides by five. We get 20 equals two x. Divide by two and x equals 10. The value of p is 10. And the correct answer is d, 10. Question seven, if x to the a squared over x to the b squared equals x to the 16, x is greater than one and a plus b equals two, what is the value of a minus b? Well, this is a good problem for students in reviews of the laws of exponents. Here we know that x to the n power over x to the m power is x to the n minus m. Applying that here, we have x to the a squared over x to the b squared is x to the a squared minus b squared. But we're given that that equals x to the 16th, meaning that those exponents above must be equivalent. The expression a squared minus b squared must equal 16. Using the factor pattern, we know a squared minus b squared is equivalent to a plus b times a minus b, which is 16. Conveniently, the writer gave us that factor a plus b equals two. So we plug that in. Two times a minus b equals 16. Divide both sides by two. And a minus b equals eight. The correct answer was a. Question eight. And a equals 360. The measure a in degrees of an exterior angle of a regular polygon is related to the number of sides of the polygon by the given formula. The measure of an exterior angle of a regular polygon is greater than 50. What is the greatest number of sides it can have? Well, here we have a three-sided polygon. It begins with the triangle. The triangle has three sides. So 360 divided by three gives an exterior angle of 120 degrees. If you look on the left, you can see that I drew the picture for an equilateral triangle freehand. And we know that each interior angle is then 60 degrees, which is the supplement to that exterior angle. 
Here I drew the exterior uh, line along the base, extending it like um, if we were looking down on a grindstone and needed to attach a, a line or a solid rod for say a workhorse or oxen to rotate the figure around, rotate the ground stone around. Similarly, if we had a, if we had a ground stone that was square shaped, we needed to attach a rod for an oxen or a horse or beast to rotate around the ground, the, uh, the, gr the grindstone. Then, well, since 360 divided by four is 90, the exterior angle is 90. And similarly, if we had a grindstone or gear and we were to attach a work rod to one side of it, 360 divided by five would give an angle of 72 degrees exterior to that shape. We can continue with this list. What if we had a six-sided uh, polygon? Then the exterior angle would be 360 divided by six or 60, 360 divided by seven for a seven-sided figure, 360 divided by eight, nine, 10, and so on. These give us the values uh, there on that mini chart on the bottom. When we get up to eight sides, the octagon, it looks like the measure of the exterior angle is now less than 50 degrees. So we need to stop. In other words, the seven-sided figure, the septagon, has an exterior angle of 51 and 3 sevenths degrees, or 51.42, approximately 51.42 degrees. So the correct answer is C. The seven-sided shape is the most number of sides, which keeps the exterior angle above 50 degrees. Question nine. The graph of a line in an xy plane has slope two and contains the point one comma eight. The graph of a second line passes through the points one, two, and two, one. If the two lines intersect at the point a, b, what is the value of a plus b? Well, here we have a line, the first line, uh, y equals mx plus b with the slope of two and xy equals, goes through the floating point uh, one comma eight. So eight equals two x or two times one plus b and b equals six, giving us the equation in slope intercept form, y equals two x plus six. For the second line, we have two floating points on the map. We can compute the slope as two minus one over one minus two, which is the slope of negative one. Then we have y equals negative one x plus b, plugging in the first point to uh, the second point, to, no, the first point, yeah, the first point, uh, one comma two, we have two equals negative one times one plus b, giving us a b value of three. So the equation of line number two is y equals negative x plus three. This gives us a system of equation with two lines. The first line is y equals two x plus six. The second line is y equals negative x plus three. To find the intersection point, set the two lines equal, which I've done here on the lower left. Here we have, the first line, 2x plus 6, equals negative x plus 3. Adding x to both sides, we have 3x plus 6 equals 3. Subtract 6, and 3x equals negative 3. Divide by 3, and x equals negative 1. Now we know x is negative 1, we can plug it into either equation. And we get that... y equals four. Why does it say y equals zero? What is wrong with this? You have x equals negative one. Look, I plug in negative one here, then that should be one. One plus three is four. Oh, that's, that's ridiculous. Sorry, uh, pardon me for a moment while I, while I fix this. Aha, so y equals four. Okay, so then AB equals negative one, four. And adding the two equations together, we get that the true answer is not C, but B is the correct answer. Uh, since we have to uh, 
then an extra step here for the um, sum of the x and y coordinates will be three. So be very careful when you're doing these steps that you don't make an error. Uh, C is not the correct answer. The correct answer certainly is B. Question 10. Which of the following equations has a graph in the xy plane for which y is always greater than or equal to negative one? Well, they don't give us the ability to use the graphing calculator, as you can see in the top of the page icon. However, we do know that choice A is an absolute value equation. So it should look something like the parent value, uh, the parent absolute value equation. This is y equals absolute value of x. The second and third equation, B and C here, are both quadratics. So they should look similar to this quadratic y equals x squared in the second picture. The third one, uh, x, y equals uh, x cubed minus two is a cubic, which we know looks similar to this uh, y equals x cubed. Well, it turns out these are all translations. These transformations are variations on these parent functions, uh, a, b, and c, and d. Well, let's see how each of these uh, parent functions have been translated. Well, the first one has negative two after the function, meaning that it'll pull all the points down two units here, like so in the graph. So that point zero, zero, for example, will be uh, translated down two units to zero, negative two. And I can write that point right there and done. Similarly, for this uh, quadratic here, we're squaring the number, but then we're taking away two from its height. So if this was the original function, it's, every point has been moved down two units. For example, zero, zero is now at zero, negative two as well. But that's true for all of the points on the, on the quadratic. For choice C, the minus two is inside the base. So the base is being shifted two units to the right. In other words, zero, zero, if we've now plugged in x equals two, two minus two is zero, so we'll get zero squared is zero. So that point two comma zero is the new vertex. It's been shifted to the right two units. And lastly, for the cubic, um, x cubed minus two, well, we're cubing it first, zero, zero is now at zero, negative two, but all of the other points also have been shifted down two units. The clever writer said, well, we want to know which graph is hovering above negative one. Like if we were looking from the side uh, of a desktop and uh, here at negative one, uh, which one never, like the pen never comes down to the paper, comes down to that level or, or so it sinks below. Well, um, the lowest point here is zero, negative two. So certainly the absolute value comes, has a section of it where it dips down below and then rises back up. Similarly with uh, choice B, well, it comes down to negative one and we know that the zero negative two is below and then it goes back up. However, choice C is the correct answer because we the translation is to the right two units. So it's always, the Y values are always positive or zero. In fact, two zero is the lowest point. It's got one point, uh, one root, and then it goes back up, right? Two is the double root. And for choice D, well, certainly it crosses over because it goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity. We know that about cubics. So uh, there must be some point here where it went from negative, uh, zero, negative two, and it crossed over and went positive. So the correct answer is C y equals x minus two squared is always greater than or equal to negative one.